I love videos about batteries. They're uh, such an important topic uh, so that we're all aware of the emerging technologies uh, and even actually sometimes uh, just to let people know about what's available now. Uh, so many people still think you need to replace an EV battery uh, every few years, like a lead acid battery. And uh, I, I once Googled, I can't remember what it was now, but uh, when a lead acid battery was created, I think it was like the 1800s or even uh, maybe even later, 1790 or something silly like that. So really old fashioned technology, even though it is kind of still useful, very old fashioned technology. You definitely don't need to replace your EV battery every three years, that's for sure. Uh, so between 2009 and 2019, the price of lithium ion batteries or lithium batteries came down by 85% in the end. And uh, it was about 10% a year at first, in the first few years when you know, Teslas were getting popular. And, uh, you know, in the Nissan Leaf, it was sort of 10% roughly each year for the first four years. And then uh, basically now it's just been fluctuating for the last few years uh, because mining, mining costs have uh, fluctuated. So the price of lithium on certain years has, has fluctuated in something like you know 30% a year difference between one year to the next. It's just sort of in brief moments, not like for the whole year and depending where you are. So batteries accounted for 74% of the world's lithium ion consumption in 2021. Uh, and it has been projected that uh, between 2022 and 2030, the global demand for lithium ion batteries will almost uh, sevenfold, reaching 4.7 terawatt hours in 2030. So in 2030, China is expected to be supplying uh, the globe with about 68% of these batteries. And then Europe, Europe is expected to supply about 11%. I'm not sure exactly how accurate this is going to be as uh, predictions like this. They're very, very tough to get right. Uh, but I always try to get my information from very credible sources or as credible a source as I can possibly get them from. And then I let you know uh, that it might not be set in stone. Uh, and basically, the, the amount of cars, EVs being sold every year is going up exponentially around the globe. Um, it's shooting up literally every single year. I've never known an industry like this. Uh, so these new batteries, such as lithium, uh, sodium ion batteries or lithium ion phosphate batteries or magnesium water, batteries, all different chemistries with pros and cons, uh, all very, very, very different batteries, of course. Um, one thing that we know is that lithium ion phosphate are now pretty much uh, the, the favoured battery for most things to do with cars and houses and things like that. Uh, so one thing that has plagued rechargeable batteries, of course, I've mentioned this before, is dendrite formations. Uh, so if, you, if you're completely new to this, I'll put some pictures on the screen for you. Um, if you kind of think about uh, the points on a car when the uh, when you take the distributor cap, cap off and you have it going like this all the time, eventually you get sort of a uh, transfer, you know, of the material that comes off like that. Um, kind of like that, I suppose, but it happens on the inside of a cell. And uh, basically you've got inside of the cell very, very tightly wound materials such as you've got an anode, a cathode, a separator, um, ordinarily an electrolyte between this as well. Uh, so in layman's terms, I won't get into the details because I'm not an expert, uh, really. I'm just informed. There are little formations that grow between the layers every time, basically, the battery is charged and discharged. Uh, and this eventually causes inside the cell small shorts uh, inside that either cause a drop in efficiency or warm spots or hot spots. Uh, in the battery. And if you're unlucky, these hotspots can get so significant that they can basically start a thermal runaway event where the battery will just get hotter and hotter and then just burst into flames. So one of the best things about magnesium batteries uh, is their ability to not really form these formations called dendrite formations. Uh, so they're a hell of a lot safer than most of the battery chemistries because of this. This is the main reason uh, that some EVs have really bad fires and have burst into you know, big, big fireballs whilst not in use in parking spaces because you can have dendrite formations uh, occur or just uh, it could just be a fault in the cell and you could get home at 5 p.m. in your quite new EV or five-year-old EV, doesn't really matter, but it's usually older ones when they're quite used and uh, park it up at 5 p.m. 
and then it could there could be a little short just creating a bit of warmth in the battery that could get worse and eventually start a fire eight hours later that's the nature of ev fires super super rare 20 times less likely to happen than a petrol or diesel uh, car being involved in a fire but it does happen and the nature of them is the concern isn't it so if you, if you were to park lots of evs under a, an apartment building what happens if that's set on fire under the apartment building at 4 a.m so that's the concern i'm not the only one to say it these are just the facts I, I, you know there's no point hiding from that uh, so the best tesla batteries are 244 watt hours per kilogram to 296 watt hours per kilogram so they're they're competitive on this front and they use very abundant materials like magnesium magnesium ion batteries offer quite an affordable energy rich substitute for other types of chemistries such as lithium ion batteries but their journey to market readiness uh, faces obstacles such as uh, limited electrolyte electrochemical range uh, in water based systems and uh, also low ionic conductivity in non water based systems uh, this is stuff you might have to google this is quite complex stuff i admit and um, a research group from the department of mechanical engineering at hku has developed a semi solid otherwise known as a quasi i think it is quasi quasi solid state magnesium ion battery with a 2.4 volt uh, voltage plateau and an energy density of 264 watt hour per kilogram which uh, which is an achievement i think that's very very good so not only does it exceed the capabilities of existing magnesium ion batteries but it also nearly rivals those of lithium ion batteries but minus the dendrite formations so then you could say that's a that's a really big deal isn't it that's a really big deal uh, basically the water based ones are uh, very low energy density right now there's some things i think they're like 65 70 75 watt hour depending on uh, the articles you read um so a lot less energy dense but it is possible to make them more energy dense they just haven't done it yet but if you're using a, a quasi one then basically they're they're very competitive in extensive cycling tests uh, in the cold, the research teams found that even under extreme colds, like minus 22 uh, to 25, so minus 22 to minus 25 Celsius, the quasi-solid state magnesium ion batteries retained 90% of uh, their original capacity after 900 cycles. And then the cost to produce these chemistries, although not confirmed at all, is said to be roughly half that of a lithium ion phosphate battery so they can do that now using less materials and they have they're that's really good that's incredible to be honest isn't it so that's a, a real battery that you could put in an electric car now and so it would be decent uh, density uh, minus the pretty much the for the dendrite formations uh, almost entirely actually um, the less materials to use uh, to, to put in them uh, and they're half the price roughly but we don't know that for sure so it's looking like they're, these are a pretty positive thing uh, so they're definitely in the mix of batteries that may one day make it into our phones and cars and i genuinely can't find a reasonable figure for just how many more cycles you could get out of either types of these uh, magnesium chemistries you've got the wet or the dry basically but i would imagine that double or triple something like that before it isn't the dendrite formations or lack thereof that bring about the end uh, of the battery basically uh, but the degradation in the chemistry cell that would be the thing that does this I think just simply the de degradation of the chemistry just falling to pieces basically just stopping working not the, the dendrite formations which is very very uh, common for causing the capacity drop in batteries there are some really smart people engineers and battery scientists i know there are actual genuine battery scientists that watch my videos so that makes me nervous talking about this stuff but if you're one of those people please put in the comments below uh, a bit more information because loads of people read the comments uh, there are some really impressive new cells as well i think beginning to uh, trickle onto the market so uh, genuinely not not uh, youtube clickbait stuff but i, I did a video uh, last year talking about CATLs or cattle as I call it uh, their new 500 watt hour per kilogram condensed battery is 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 kind of what we're all calling it uh 
But in terms of single purpose cells designed purely to max out specific energy, uh, the previous highest figure ever reported was 575 watt hour per kilogram anode free patch cells uh, tested by Dalhousie University professor Jeff Darn, I think he was called, in his, and his team. So basically, cattle now, since you know lithium ion phosphate, the next really you know quite safe energy dense battery coming uh, from the market now is cattle's uh, you know the, the high density battery basically. So there's a bit of nerves about it, but it has passed all its tests, so that should be good to go. And that offers not 200 you know 250 to 300 like Tesla, but 500 watt hour per kilogram. So that really could be a big again I'm going to say the word game changer on YouTube I hate saying that but uh, it really could be so I know this is not the only thing that matters to the EU but if they are more environmentally friendly to produce then the EU will basically favor them I think or there's a good chance that they will get favored by the EU so they also just banned chroming of metal things on bikes and cars for example because that still emits a lot of rubbish that's very harmful to humans and uh, they're also, you know, of course, pushing for cleaner air uh, all over Europe. And in Europe, for example, our cars emit 38% uh, of the amount of gases and particulates uh, than the vehicles on the roads in Australia right now, for example. Uh, and I actually remember going to Australia the f for the first time years ago. And, with, you know, on the first day, it hit me immediately how much it stunk. And I thought that it was quite an interesting thing and I but actually uh, I, I remember chatting to a young lad who was getting his first car which was a uh, a four litre straight six barra Ford engine with something like 200 300 kilowatts so a few hundred horsepower so I think that's maybe partly why uh, so we're definitely going into the next generation of batteries in the next 10 years I think we're definitely going into the next generation of batteries in the next 10 years for sure I remember when lithium ion phosphate batteries came out really uh, you know, and became really popular in our electric cars and house storage batteries just a few years ago. Uh, and these new chemistries such as magnesium and, and, and water based batteries, they, they do work really, really well and uh, they could really transform things over the globe, uh, especially you know places like China. They're shoveling huge amounts of money into chemistries like this, like you would not believe. Uh, so it is not going to be a shock in the next one or two or three or four years as things progress that you can start to go buy a car. For example, like the BYD Seagull, a lot of people are talking about the sodium ion batteries in the BYD Seagull. Uh, that's real. It really does work. It's just got slightly less density uh, than a lithium ion uh, phosphate battery, but it is very, very good. So uh, just as a side note, if you're watching this, you probably are interested in battery chemistry and energy storage in general. Never underestimate uh, some of the oldest technology that we have. I've been interested in this for a long time. Uh, so such as storing heat in sand, for example. Sand can store heat up to 600 degrees Celsius and uh, more if you ask some people. And uh, inertia batteries, otherwise called uh, flywheel batteries. That these things are fantastic. I'll put some photos on the screen for you. Uh, the inertia batteries, where they basically they use magnetic fans to reduce friction, and they put them in a vacuum as well. Uh, so basically, it's the energy isn't really wasted uh, from the, something spinning. And they often bury these inertia batteries underground for some reason. I'm not sure. Maybe safety. I don't know. Uh, but they work amazing. You know, I do question some of our logic sometimes to work with chemistries when we can finesse some of these old technologies even more so and use them for, you know, powering lights and running heaters in factories, for example. Let me know what you all think about these new batteries anyway and uh, the chemistries we've got on, on offer in the next few years. Thank you for watching and uh, see you in the next video tomorrow.